Hello everyone and welcome back to episode 3 of our Where Am I podcast. I would just like to apologise uh, on no episode yesterday. I was busying myself with some university work which has now been uh, completed so I am ready to return to uh, doing this podcast hopefully on a daily basis where possible. I did actually release uh, where I was on day two on my Facebook, Instagram and Twitter feeds, uh, so you may have seen that. If not, I will uh, give you a chance to guess again by t uh, giving you the clues uh, that I gave you in on episode two to where I was that day. So the clues were, I was at a uh, stone, uh, megalithic stone um, standing stone site in uh, the Scottish islands or isles. Um, it is an unusual site as it's in the form of a cruciform with a central stone circle. And another clue I gave it was actually a site that I visited and wrote about on my blog back in 2018. So you very well may have seen me post pictures from that visit. So I am going to give you a slight pause, or you can indeed pause the video uh, to see if you can guess uh, where I was, if you haven't already. I'll just provide a little bit of background music. Okay, so I think that is enough time. I was, of course, at the Kalanesh or Kalanish stones uh, in um, the Outer Hebrides on the Isle of Lewis. As I uh, mentioned, this is a site that I was indeed very privileged to visit back in 2018 on a family holiday, and I would definitely recommend going to visit if you get a chance as well. Just stand in stone, stone sites, stand in stones there, use a nice little museum, and if I remember correctly, a lovely little cafe as well and the site staff there were lovely and very informative. So as mentioned the Kalanish Stones is on the Isle of Lewis. It is a um, an arrangement of standing stones that form a sort of cruciform with a central stone circle and within that stone circle you do have a sort of central standing stone or monolith and a chambered tomb as well. And as well as that, it also has um, the sort of cruciform bits are formed by a series of uh, sort of avenues um, or rows of stones uh, which run out from the settlement. So starting at the central settlement, we've got the centre stone. Now a centre monolith stands, you know, just actually just off centre. It's not exactly centre. Um, of the stone circle and is almost around about five meters high, around about two and a half meters wide and a, almost ha uh, half a meter thick. Um, and the largest sort of sides of the stones are almost perfectly orientated north and south and the sort of its shape is very sort of reminiscent of a ship's, uh, ship's weather. Um, working our way out, you have the chambered tomb or cairn which is there, uh, which is between the uh, central and eastern uh, monolith of the stone circle. It measures around about six and a half metres long um, and it was built sometime later than the stone circle, although we don't know exactly when it was necessarily built. Um, there's also another stone cairn uh, northeast of the stone circle, um, which has now been sort of reduced to ground level, um, and the outline can only just sort of be it's only sort of just visible now. Uh, but it's not uh, entirely sure what its link is actually to the rest of the Cavendish stones. So again, working out from the central stone and the monolith, you've got the stone circle, which consists of a total of thirteen stones, and has a diameter of around about eleven and a half meters. Uh, again, it's not a perfect. The stone circle is not a perfect cir circle, and it's slightly flattened on the, the uh, eastern side. So the measurements north south are about thirteen and a half meters, and it's about twelve meters east to west. 
Uh, the stones, all, the rough sort of average height of each of the stones in the stone circle are around about three metres, and a ring covers an area of 124 square metres. It's actually quite small compared to other similar circles, including Karanish 2, uh, which is doesn't lie too far uh, <coughs> from the site, which is uh, over two times as big. So again, working our way out from the site, we've got um, these sort of stone rows or stone avenues. The northern um, avenue uh, connects the stone connects to the stone circle from the north or northeast, north northeast, and it uh, is about almost eighty five meters long and consists of nineteen stones, uh, which still remain nine stones on the east and ten on the rest and they on the west let's just pronounce that a bit more uh, firmly and the uh, largest stone is around about three and a half meters in height and stands uh, on the end of that uh, western uh, row the two rows again are not exactly parallel to each other but they sort of fan out at the northern end um, of the avenue so there are the stone rows or avenues um, <coughs> which come out from the circle. One comes from the east northeast, one from the south, and one from the west or southwest. Uh, this, the east northeast row today consists of five stones and is around 23 meters long. The southern row consists of five stones and is about 27 meters long. And the, and the west southwest row consists of four stones and is around 13 meters long. Uh, none of the stone rows are aimed at the center of the stone circle. <coughs> the east northeast uh, row is aligned to a point two meters to the south of the center. The south row points to one meter west of the center and the west southwest row points one meter to the south of the center as well. Um, an interesting uh, point is that a, a geophysical survey was actually conducted back in 2019 and revealed a what was described as a star-shaped magnetic anomaly possibly caused by a uh, historical or ancient lightning strike um, and it is believed this may date back to around about 3,000 years ago. So how old is the Kalanish stones? Um, the circle it is believed to have been set up between or been erected somewhere between 2900 to 2600 BC, but the site was in use before uh, before that point. First traces of human activity are indicated by a broad ditch, uh, which is no longer actually visible above the ground, uh, which appears to have belonged to some kind of structure or enclosure. This may have been a ritual structure, but also could equally have been, uh, been a domestic place as well. Um, around the around the centuries surrounding 300, uh, sorry, 3000 BC, however, the site was turned over to agriculture, which obliter obliterated most of these sort of earlier evidences of any potential structure, and uh, the site was allowed to grass over until uh, you see we still we see the first phases of building of the stone circle. Um, so again, yes, as we said, the stone circle was built somewhere between 2900 to 2600 BC. And again, it's not clear what came first on the site. Um, was the stone circle first? Was the avenues first? Was the monolith first? We do know that the cairn was built after the uh, stone circle due to the stratigraphy of the site. Um, and uh, sort of many uh, sort of, uh, pottery fragments found in and around the tomb uh, indicate that the tomb was probably in use maybe for a couple of centuries. These pottery fragments include not only local Hebridean pots but also numerous sherds of beaker vessels dating to around 2000 to 1700 BC and sher sherds of grooved ware as well. Uh, the Kalanish stones appear to fall out of use somewhere between 1500 to 1000 BC um, and was uh, potentially um, despoiled by later Bronze Age farmers um, as fragments of the pots appear to be cast out of the Ken chamber. This may have just been sort of ordinary agricultural debris, although this may have been 
also a sort of ritual cleansing. Uh, but the tomb does seem to be rebuilt at a later date uh, after this period, but this may have been for domestic use, um, as there's no other evidence for any sort of ritual, ritual-linked activity at the chamber, no more sort of associated sort of ritual pottery or ritual activities. Then somewhere between 1000 BC and 500 BC, the stones were covered over by a thick layer of uh, turf and peat, and it is estimated that the place was probably abandoned around about 800 uh, BC. Um, the overlaying turf was only of the site was only removed in 1857. Um, and when when that was when that actually peat was removed, it was around about you know one and a half meters deep um, in total. So it was quite quite heavily buried during that time. Now, so now we get on to what was Kalanesh used for? Well, that is always a question, isn't it? With these kind of sites, there are often multiple interpretations uh, that people uh, come up with. Um, Alexander Fawn and Gerald Hawkins suggested that the stones were a prehistoric lunar observatory and others have uh, proposed a relationship between the stones, the moon and the um, Clisham, not sure if I'm pronouncing that right, mountain range on Harris. However, there, have, there are many critics of these theories um, who suggest that these alignments are likely to exist purely by chance in any such structure and many factors such as weathering and displacement of stones over the long, long years and millennia mean that there can be no certainty of any such alignments, original or otherwise. So that it is still up to debate. Now again, there are many uh, folklore or, le or legends which also surround uh, the Kalanish stones. According to uh, one uh, legend or tradition, the Kalanish stones were petrified giants who would not convert to Christianity. And in the 17th century, the people of Lewis were calling uh, the stones false men. Another le legend points to uh, that on the, the midsummer morning, an entity known as the Shining One walks the length of the avenue. His coming is heralded by the call of the cuckoo. But again, it's uh, not interpretations uh, there are still many interpretations and the best way to find out more about the site I would say is definitely go that to go there and look at the site look at the museum and make up your own mind potentially what uh, Kalanish was and its importance I will also put some links uh, if you want to know more about Kalanish in the description because again if we went on and talked uh, about Kalanish and uh, what interpretations might be and more information about the stone circle we could be here for quite a long time so we are going to move on and we are going to uh, look at I'm going to give you two sets of clues for uh, this podcast today I have got one planned and then I am going to kind of do a random search I've not done it yet I don't believe in doing these sort of things off the podcast. I don't really write scripts for these either. Um, I have a few notes that I have written down, but no fixed script because I like this to feel slightly more organic. I hate things which are heavily scripted. So I will give you the clues for the first site and then I will choose a site at random and give you the clues for that. Um, so this site has always has fascinated me and I wish I knew more about it, which is sort of one of the reasons why I'm doing this podcast, so I can plan a little bit more, find out a bit more about it. And I may actually plan a proper script for tomorrow's um, podcast uh, to explore this site a bit more in detail. So I will give you the clues I have for you today. It is a... I hate using the word ancient, it's never good, but it is a ancient city that 
is carved into a rock face. Uh, another name for it is Rakmu. And it is a very important archaeological and tourist site in Jordan. Now, if you've now not got it from those clues, which uh, I imagine you might or might have a good idea for where I am, this site appears heavily in uh, popular culture, especially in uh, films. Um, it has, and of course, as every archaeologist should know, this site has appeared in Indian, Indiana Jones and The Last Crusade. It's also appeared in Arabian Nights, Passion in the Desert, Mortal Kombat Annihilation, Sinbad and the Eye of the Tiger, The Mummy Returns, Transformers Revenge of the Fallen, and many, many, many more. And it's also appeared in various plays, literature, TV series, and has inspired various music, uh, and music and been used in music videos. And again, it appears in uh, video games as well. So it is well represented within popular culture. But again, if you can't get it from that, it's an ancient carved city in Jordan also known as Rakmu and has appeared in Indiana Jones and the Last Crusade, then I'm not entirely sure uh, what other clues I could give you to try and guess where this site is. So there is site one. So now we are just going to try our luck looking at, for a random site by using the wonders of the internet. So bear with me. So in this time of lockdown, have you guys been looking at uh, any sites virtually? Have you been using any virtual um, any virtual software to explore different sites? Have you been looking at various um, virtual exhibitions and galleries that have popped up over the recent, uh, past couple of months? If you have, please do let me know, comment in the description below um, because I'll be very interested to hear what you guys are looking at as well. So let's have a look here. What other site could I choose? Okay, here is one. And again, this one is slightly outside my comfort. Um, comfort zone. So here we go. This is a very famous ship burial, Anglo-Saxon ship burial, uh, from England in Woodbridge in Suffolk. It has a very um, famous bit of associated headwear found uh, with it as well. And again, I think, you know, most people should be able to get it from those clues or at least easily be able to do a bit of Googling to find that out at least. So yeah, yeah no, I think, I think I'm gonna be very mean and those are the only clues I'm gonna go, gonna go with. So it is a famous, famous Anglo-Saxon ship burial uh, in Woodbridge, Suffolk, England, and has a very famous bit of headwear associated with it. So those are your two clues for today. And I would just like to, again, thank you very much for tuning in to this episode of the podcast. Again, if you've enjoyed these podcasts, please hit the like button, subscribe, share with your friends and hit that notification bell so you um, do find out when the next one is uploaded. Again, I'm gonna try and do these as daily or as daily as possible. I can't make any guarantees uh, at this moment, but I am very much enjoying them and I promise these will get better and more fluid as they go along, but I'm still quite new to doing this kind of format. Um, so I'm sure I'll find something which works well 
for me and get to a better flow. But again, thank you again for watching. Please let me know if you've been looking at anything interesting on the internet, preferably archaeology related or museum related, not just random things. Although random stuff is cool, but just try and keep it relevant. Do let me know. Take care, stay safe, and thank you for listening.